We next discuss exactly how to do that. Uh, our Climate Leaders Live is with David Neppi, and uh, Energy and uh, Natural Resource Partner at Oliver Wyman. And also, Marzia is back on stage. Uh, she is, of course, uh, the Director of Policy and Sustainability at Calusa. Let's talk about what we just heard um, Michael talk about. He wants to do this transition. We've heard this all morning. We want to move towards this transition, David. How do we do it? What's, what are the first steps in the process to make sure this transition happens so that we do not roll backwards when things get tough? Yeah, great, great question and a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I think the, a key point he made was about how much we need to reduce emissions by 2030. I mean, he said 40%. Uh, that's a significant amount. Uh, if you think about that, uh, that gives us nine years. We, we largely have the technologies we have at our fingertips today to do that in the next nine years. And therefore, I think it is about some of the pledges that have been made, uh, things like moving away from coal, super important, uh, certainly defunding uh, fossil fuels and accelerating the investment into deploying renewables. Um, and then also, I think pledges like the methane pledge are going to be absolutely critical because uh, the carbon equivalent footprint associated with the use of uh, natural gas is significant. So we need to really challenge the industry to decarbonize the existing system whilst we transform to the new system. What are the steps you, uh, you advise when someone goes into this process and, says, and, and tell them how to do it? What, it? what are those first steps? I mean, the first thing is to have, a, I think, an honest uh, reflection on your existing setup as a company. Uh, what is your contribution, both directly and indirectly, to this? Uh, and what is your commitment? What is your leadership on this issue? And are you really setting out a stretching commitment to, to, to drive that decarbonization? Uh, if, I, if I reflect again on, on methane, as I just mentioned, there's a huge amount of venting and flaring going on around the world associated with the production of fossil fuels. And quite frankly, it just needs to stop. We could stop it tomorrow. Uh, and therefore, I think we need greater commitment by leaders in the industry to make that happen. How do you make data work towards that, to convince boards, to convince shareholders who might not be fully into the concept, but are saying yes because it's politically the right thing to say? How does data convince them? I think uh, I, I would go back, I would um, use this analogy. Um, when, you, when you go to the grocery store and you get uh, a, uh, a box of cereal, you look at it, or anything, you look at it and it has the nutritional factors in it. Um, what we need in the energy industry is standardized carbon reporting. So everybody knows, whether you're in the board member or you're a consumer, who is emitting what, when, and how. I think that will go a long way. That type of data will go a long way in making uh, GAG emissions um, not just a, a political statement, but making it real, making it personal. So I think, I think carbon reporting is something that, that, that we should think about. And a lot of, you know, there's, there's requirements by some companies uh, that they have to report, but some other, some other industries don't have to report. The way the reporting is, uh, is being made is different. So standard carbon reporting, I think, could go a long way. And then, you know, I, I chose to work for Calusa for a reason. Uh, I left the energy, I left the, the regulatory um, industry for a reason, because I think making data available to consumers is a powerful, powerful thing to do. Because right now, consumers are blind to what kind of GEG emissions are out there, how much their house uh, is contributing to climate change. We need to make that information readily available to consumers in a way that is digestible to them. So that's why I think that is the power of data. I, I would uh, agree totally, Marzia. The, the only thing I would say on top of that is I think we already know uh, how much emissions are being uh, you know, produced in the world. Uh, what that would do, I think, is attribute that uh, to individual actors. Uh, but what we need on top of that, of course, is some kind of price signal that says, actually, it's not that this is a costless option. So uh, coming back to things like flaring of gas, you know, we know that's bad for the, for the environment, but why does it keep happening? It keeps happening because it's the economically rational thing to do if you're running a company that is trying to produce hydrocarbons for the world. But actually, if we can put a penalty, put a cost on that, that drives action and drives behavior that stops that, I think that's absolutely critical. How is that going to work, David, for the global south, for developing markets, because they're heavily reliant, because this would be then a global standard. Um, you are then talking about potentially 
penalizing large economies of uh, people who have not reached the development level of the West? Yeah, I think it's a super important question and, and something I'm, I'm certainly very uh, mindful of is we need a just transition, right? So, you know, those of us in the, in the Western developed economies are actually responsible for most of the carbon that's in the atmosphere today. And it's the emerging economies, the ones that don't have economic prosperity, may not even have the, the basics of heat and light that we all enjoy. So let's remind ourselves this isn't just about those of us driving around in Western cities getting an electric vehicle. It's actually about how do we decarbonize energy systems that can uh, it enable the vast population growth of you know between one and two billion of extra uh, people on the planet in the next 20 years, whilst allowing economies to develop and enjoy that prosperity. So, I think as we as we look at energy solutions, we should not be taking things off the table. If, for example, natural gas done in an economically responsible and environmentally responsible way can actually provide energy security and growth to economies en route to a switch to green hydrogen, then I think we should be getting behind that. So that the answer isn't just you know, we save the planet, but actually we strand people in energy poverty. How do you, again, I'm going to bring back data into this. How do you collect and collate the data that can help do just that? Because there seems to be a lot of pressure on the global south and the developing world to take the same levels of action as the Western developed economies, but the data that they're talking about doesn't seem to ever make it on the table. How do you bridge that, that discussion? I would say that I think we have to. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure how to bridge that. That I do think that um, we need to have, uh, as David pointed out, a just a just transition, and that means our expectations of the Western world, of the developed world, has to be different than our expectations of the developing world and the third world countries. Um, in in we have to make sure that the developed countries, the consumers in those developed countries have the data to then put pressure on the companies and on their governments to make the change. But there has to be, you know, earlier, earlier when I, when, before our first panel, uh, the U.S. representative um, mentioned that uh, as part of the question of how committed uh, is, is the U.S. And, and he started out uh, putting some numbers that the U.S. is spending billions of dollars uh, and other countries should do it too. And, you know, I'm a U.S. citizen, a proud U.S. citizen, but the U.S. is supposed to spend that much money. Uh, we can't expect um, a Vietnam or a, an Afghanistan or, or, or another country to, to spend even, even an, uh, close to that. So I think, I think that's where... We, we need to bring that level of transparency and responsibility to the, develop, to the developed countries as well. Let's talk about how you, you make that transition in the West, since we can, in some ways, hold the companies responsible. Even here, there seems to be a dichotomy of approach. And we've heard a lot about investors putting in so much money, pledging so much money for investments into, uh, into the transition. But again, if you take a look at what's happening in the US, investors are saying, hang on a minute, we would rather our energy companies do what they do best, a completely different approach to Europe where they're being asked to go green and are willingly going green. Do you see even that, that very separate approach between the US and Europe impacting the way we transition going forward? Maybe I can just comment on that quickly. So I think we need to do two things in the world. Um, I think we need to decarbonize our existing fossil fuel-based energy system at pace. And I think in parallel, we need to be transitioning and transforming that into green alternatives. So actually, if you look at it, and there is a bit of a uh, kind of Europe versus US divide on that. I, I observe a lot of the US companies saying they're going to focus initially on the decarbonization of the existing system. And I see the Europeans saying they're going to transform into renewable energies and into electric vehicles. I think that's actually great. Both of those things are critical uh, to achieve. And oftentimes we, we kind of point to, well, it's, surely it's about the transformation, so let's all shift away. Let's remind ourselves that the amount of fossil fuels we will use in the next three decades is substantial. It's probably about half of what we're using today on average. If we don't decarbonize the heck out of that, we've got a major problem. So I think you've got to applaud both of those things and encourage them both to happen at pace. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, we all come from different backgrounds and different cultures and, and different um, economies. So we can't expect the same, uh, the same um, 
way of doing things from everybody. So the U.S., uh, for instance, with, with respect to energy, the U.S. is a little more uh, regulated than Europe. Europe is, is, uh, has a lot more customer choice than, than the U.S. But they're both, they're, they both have ambitious goals. So however way you want to get to your goals, you should be able to get to your goals. I don't think it should be a prescriptive roadmap. But that this is why um, events like COP is so supreme, supremely important, because we get to set mandates, but we get to get there in our own way, based on our own economies and our own culture, our own way of life. But is that fast enough, David, in, in the way that it's being done right now? And should the conversations that we're having with these institutional investors who are excited finally about the transition, do those conversations need to change? What do you think? I, mean, I think the shorthand answer is no, it's not fast enough. And I think every day that goes by, we're seeing an acceleration of the expectation. And I'm, I'm sure that's going to continue. Um, but what I'm observing, certainly in the last 18 months, is far greater engagement on this topic, far greater levels of commitment. We're not there yet. I expect we need to see a lot more uh, executive teams and boards make a very substantial commitment and lay out a pathway to get there. But at the same time, let's also recognize that the things that we're asking them to do oftentimes are uneconomic today, either because there isn't a price signal from, for carbon or because a lot of the technologies are at the innovative, you know, they're not at world scale potential today. And actually these companies are investing all of our money into these. So, you know, investors don't typically, you know, ask for highly risky, low return investments on their money. So we need to find ways to innovate fast enough to make these technologies economically viable. Then we can really lean in at pace and it will be consistent the corporate action and the investor returns associated with that. Um, just on that, that fast enough uh, um, approach, what I, what I would say is that we, we expect a lot from investors, we expect a lot from uh, companies, we expect a lot from governments, but we don't, ex we don't, uh, we, we don't expect a lot from, from everyday people. Uh, they protest and, and then when you go home, what is, what is your behavior? Are you, are you reducing your consumption? Are you energy efficient? Are you recycling? Do you have an electric vehicle? We need to also expect from people to make, from individual people to make changes in their everyday life. That's how we're gonna move forward as well. I think it's interesting, because I think you and I were talking about this earlier this morning, and Roberta is asking a very similar question. I know that's good, gonna be a good one for you. Agreed that the consumer must know that they're buying to make a better choice, but why is it so difficult to have a GHD labeling for consumers on different products as we do for food on a nutritious labeling? Uh, it's something we talked about, and how do, you, how, do you, how do you address that? I, whoever asked that question, I'm totally with you. We definitely need carbon reporting, a standardized carbon reporting. I think the nutritional factor analogy is, is right on. Once we get there, we get to change people's behavior. So I think if, if nothing else, in, in, in uh, events like COP, we need to figure out a way to uh, convince the develop. This is something that we, sh we can all come together for, with. Whether you're, whether you're a poor country, a, a middle income country, or a rich country, we should all be able to do standard carbon reporting. Then you can bring consumers along. David, this, sorry, finish yeah, your so talk. I think, I, again, I agree with that. I think the inherent challenge here, of course, is we need three things in the world. We need clean energy, we need energy security, and we need affordable energy. And oftentimes when you ask consumers to choose you know, which one they would like, they say they would like the clean energy and then they choose the cheap energy. So what we need is actually a way to make it, it's unacceptable to have the carbon going into the atmosphere. It's truly charged for the consumer's end just choosing between clean energy choices, not between a cheaper, dirtier one or a, a clean, expensive one. Well, big tobacco comes to mind and the strategies used for that could be quite useful in this respect in some ways. Um, so. Tell me we should actually you... talk. About, we should talk with the recycling industry. How did they make recycling kind of sort of a, an everyday thing for us to do? I recycle because I feel like I must recycle. I don't know who told me that, but I have to recycle. We all recycle. Who doesn't recycle? Which country doesn't recycle anymore? How do we do? How do we translate that to the to carbon as well? There's so many examples we can use as a stepping stone. So tell me. What do, you, what do you think about the International Sustainability Standards Board announcement that was made uh, last week as well, where they've said companies will have a way to 
describe their climate impact and some sort of a, a, a standard can be set. Was that impressive enough uh, a, a step for you or was that kind of muted as well? Well, I mean, I think it is an extremely helpful thing to do to standardize the disclosures that are made. So I think if we can simplify in particular the handshake between the commitments and the actions of corporates and either consumers you know, assessing those or investors deciding where to put their capital, that can only be a good thing to help to accelerate the mobilization of capital into the energy transition and indeed changing consumer demand, which will ultimately uh, drive the direction of these companies. The other, the other question I had was, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting in the mountains of Slovakia uh, in, in, in Eastern Europe, talking to a whole bunch of um, uh, companies who were struggling with power and all the issues there. And they essentially came back and told me, it's, it's, not, it's not on our radar right now. We don't care. We just want to survive. Um, at some point, I keep coming back to this, uh, this problem that we seem to have, that when we go from crisis to crisis, and we're looking for something that feels far away, 2030, 2050, we feel sometimes that the strategy can be put off for another couple of years, because it takes a while to build stuff anyways, right? Is that a danger we face today? I, I think, in, if for those of us in the UK, we've just experienced a little bit of this. We've had extremely high gas prices and power prices. We've had no fuel at the petrol pumps uh, for those of us who drive around still on, on ICE vehicles. And, and you look at that and you say, well, why is that? Well, it's because of the choices that we're making around our energy infrastructure. So, and again, I come back to, we need to have clean energy, but it needs to be affordable and it needs to be reliable. Otherwise, we're gonna have energy security problems. I do, I do think you're right that, that we are in that state of, well, it's 10 years from now, or it's not, it's not going to be in my lifetime, so I'll do, I'll do what I can, but you know, it's somebody else's problem. I think it's once we, once we make it everybody's problem, everybody's aware, but we haven't made it everybody's problem. Once we make it everybody's problem, I think they, oh, I shouldn't say we make it everybody's problem. Once we, once we show that this is a problem for me today, then I think that change can happen. Two things that you can leave all of us with in terms of some hope, because at the end of this, we want to walk out of here with a little bit of hope that we're making a difference in all of the things that we're doing. What are the two key things that you would say are absolutely necessary for the C-suite and the private sector, uh, for public servants who may be li listening in this audience to do the minute they get back on next Monday? Well, maybe one observation is, I think, the, the, the recent defense announcements about the $130 trillion looking for opportunities is a really exciting thing. So the, the mobilization of capital is, is waiting. So if I was in one of these uh, organizations, I'd be going, how do I get my hands on that? How do I use that to drive the company forward? And how do I see the opportunities that are going to come with the energy transition, not just the risks and the downsides? And don't use the loopholes. <laughs> Uh, if I was if I was an energy utility executive, I would go back and look to see, do I have the right technology today to be able to communicate to my customers and tell them why climate change is an issue? If I don't have that technology, how can I get it? That was short and sweet, Marzia. Thank you very much for that, David. Thank you also for your time. Thank you. um, Give a round of applause to the two of them who've left us with some interesting thoughts to take back to after COP.